This is chapter 28, the reproductive system. So we're going to start with a review of mitosis and meiosis, which are the two types of cell division. So first, let's look at mitosis. So most of your body cells undergo mitosis, and during mitosis, the cell produces an identical copy of itself. So at the end of mitosis, you have two identical diploid daughter cells. And diploid means that you have two of each type of chromosome. So all of our cells contain a pair of 23 different chromosomes for a total of 46 chromosomes, making the majority of the cells in our body diploid. So in this example shown in this image, this particular parent cell starts out with six chromosomes, so it has two of each kind, which is shown by the different colors, two blue, two gray, and two red. And so at the end of mitosis, the two daughter cells will be identical and will also have six total chromosomes, which are three pairs. So prior to mitosis, DNA is replicated. So the DNA is copied so that each chromosome has what is called a sister chromatid. And after this happens, this is when those chromosomes take on that little X appearance. So these are actually duplicated chromosomes. And then during mitosis, and we're not going to go into the different phases, the sister chromatids get separated to create two identical daughter cells. And then we have meiosis, which only occurs in our sex cells. And so with meiosis, we start off with one of our normal parent cells. So we start off with a diploid cell. But in the end, we have four unique haploid daughter cells. And haploid means they have only one of each chromosome. So in the case of humans, our haploid uh, gametes will only have 23 chromosomes. So again, if we start out with six chromosomes, two of each type, when we end up, we only have three chromosomes and we only have one of each type. And then because genetic material can be swapped between the two types of chromosomes, each of these uh, gametes has the potential to be completely unique from the other. So they are not genetically identical. So prior to meiosis one, and meiosis is actually divided into two stages, meiosis one and meiosis two. Prior to meiosis one, the DNA is replicated just like it was in mitosis so that each chromosome has a sister chromatid. So again, you see the little X structures. However, for meiosis one, the homologous chromosomes are also paired together. So like the two uh, dark chromosomes here get paired together, the two red ones get paired together, and the two blue ones get paired together to form these structures that look like they have four legs on each side, which are called tetrads. So during the first cell division called meiosis one, the homologous chromosomes are separated. So you can see at the end of meiosis one here, I only have one of each type of chromosome, one dark, one red, one blue. This one has one dark, one red, and one blue, but they're still attached to their sister chromatids. So then during meiosis two, the second stage, the sister chromatids are separated. So this works a lot like mitosis. And then I end up with four unique haploid gametes. All right, so now we can start looking at the reproductive systems and we'll start with an introduction and overview. So the function of the reproductive systems are to produce, store, nourish, and transport functional gametes. And as a reminder, the gametes are the male and female reproductive cells, so sperm in males and oocytes in females, and they contain only one of each type of chromosome. So these are haploid cells that were formed by meiosis. So the basic components of the reproductive system in both sexes include gonads, which are organs that produce gametes and hormones, so the testes in males and the ovaries in females. Then you have ducts to receive and transport the gametes. You have accessory glands and organs that secrete fluids. And you have external genitalia. 
Note that we're not going to be covering all of the material in this chapter. We'll also be covering a little something extra. So refer to the PowerPoint and learning objectives when studying this chapter. So let's look at a quick overview of the male reproductive system, and then we're going to go into detail later on. So as I mentioned previously, testes are the male gonads. They produce the male gametes, which are called sperm. And males produce about a half a billion sperm every day. The testes also produce male sex hormones, which are called androgens. Testosterone is the main androgen. So some terminology related to the male system. Emission is the process where mature sperm travel along a lengthy duct system and are mixed with accessory gland secretions. And this happens in the structure called the ejaculatory duct. Semen is actually a mix of sperm and fluid from the accessory glands. And ejaculation is the process where the semen is expelled from the body. So now let's look at an overview of the female system. So as mentioned earlier, ovaries are the female gonads. They release one immature gamete called an oocyte each month from puberty to menopause. And they produce the female sex hormones, which are estrogens and progesterone. So during sexual intercourse, ejaculation by the male introduces semen into the vagina of the female. And if a sperm reaches the oocyte, fertilization occurs. And then the job of the uterus is to enclose and support the developing embryo. So that was a quick overview, and now we're going to go into detail. So we will start with the male reproductive structures, and in this section we're going to look at the testes, scrotum, and spermatic cord. So let's first look at testes development. So the testes actually develop inside the body cavity adjacent to the kidneys. So up here is a picture of a two-month-old fetus. So you can see that the testis is way up here in the abdominal pelvic cavity. And there is a structure called the gubernaculum testis, which is a bundle of connective tissue that connects the testes to an inferior pocket in the peritoneum. Now I want you to notice in this top picture, I want you to look at this, the uh, measurement scale here. So the length from the attachment to the testis in this picture is five millimeters. So what happens is that the gubernaculum testis does not grow as the fetus grows. So as the fetus grows and enlarges, this, uh, sh this cord that stays the same length basically pulls the testes downward. So if you look at this picture from three months gestation, you can see that the gubernaculum testis is still five millimeters long. It's just the fetus itself grew larger and the gubernaculum testes did not. So around the seventh month of gestation, hormones cause a further contraction of the gubernaculum testis, and this allows the testes to descend down into the scrotum. So cryptorchidism is when one or both testes do not descend by birth. This is actually more common in premature births, so it happens in about 30% of the cases in a premature baby, only about 3% of the time in a full-term baby. Normally, descent will occur within a few weeks after birth, and if it doesn't, it can be corrected surgically. So cryptorchid testes will actually not produce sperm, because in order to produce sperm, the testes has to be at a lower body temperature than the core body temperature. So if it stays in the abdominal pelvic cavity, it will be too warm for it to produce sperm. So the spermatic cords are paired structures that contain the ductus deferens, blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic vessels that supply the testes. So as the testes descend between month seven and birth, the spermatic cord is going to move along with it. And then down here, you can see the entire spermatic cord in the adult. 
So the spermatic cord begins at the structure called the inguinal canal and then descends down into the scrotum. It is wrapped in connective tissue and muscle. And the inguinal canal, which is the area where it passes through the abdominal muscles, so this is the passageway through the abdominal muscles for the spermatic cord. Note that the ductus deferens is the same thing as the vas deferens. So I'm going to continue using ductus deferens because that is a terminology used by your textbook. So the inguinal canal closes after the testes descend down into the scrotum. However, the fact that the spermatic cord still passes through the muscle wall creates a weak spot in the abdominal muscle wall. So an inguinal hernia is when you have protrusion of visceral tissue or organs into the inguinal canal. So down here, this is showing an inguinal hernia, and in this case, some of the intestines have poked through this weak spot. So there can be different types of inguinal hernias. In some cases, the inguinal hernia can cause the intestines or other contents to actually go all the way down into the scrotum. Sometimes it may only protrude through the canal and then form a lump on the anterior side of the body. And inguinal hernias are fairly common in males because they do have this weak spot caused by the spermatic cord going through the abdominal muscles. So the scrotum is divided internally into two chambers. So if you look at the picture on the right, the two chambers are completely separate from each other. And so they are actually two separate scrotal cavities. And this actually ensures that if you have infection or inflammation of one testis, it will not spread and affect the other. So this helps to protect a male's reproductive capability. The tunica vaginalis is a serous membrane that lines the scrotal cavity. It is actually an isolated part of the peritoneum, so it is the same structure as the peritoneum that we talked about in chapter 24. And it has parietal and visceral layers, so if you look here it says tunica va uh, vaginalis. You can see it's pointing to the layer that surrounds the actual testis and it's pointing to the layer that lines the cavity itself. So that would be the parietal layer and that would be the visceral layer. So as mentioned earlier, sperm production requires two degrees Fahrenheit lower temperature than body temperature. That is why the testes descend into the scrotum so they can be held away from the core of the body so they can be at a lower temperature. So there is a muscle called the dartos muscle, which is a smooth muscle underneath the dermis of the scrotum. And then there is also the cremaster muscle, which is this larger muscle that is deep to the dermis. So the muscles can contract and relax to move the testes either closer to the body or farther from the body in order to regulate the temperature. And this is called the cremaster reflex. So for example, if a man gets into like water, like a swimming pool that's a very cold temperature, the scrotum will contract and pull the testes in closer to the body to help keep them at the right temperature. These muscles also contract during sexual arousal. So if we take a closer look inside the testis itself, so note that testes is plural, testis is singular. So inside the testis, there is a septa testis, which are fibrous partitions that divide each testis into lobules. So each of these little elongated structures down here would be a single lobule, and they're divided by the septa testis, which is this connective tissue. So within each lobule are approximately 800 tightly coiled seminiferous tubules. And a typical testis has about one half mile of seminiferous tubules. So both together would be a mile of tubules. And the seminiferous tubules is where sperm production actually takes place. So several seminiferous tubules converge into straight tubules, shown here. And then the straight tubules interconnect to form a maze of passageways called the reti testis, and that is shown here. And then 15 to 20 efferent ductules will connect the reti testes to the epididymis, and this is the start of the epididymis up here. 
So the testis also contains interstitial endocrine cells, which were formerly called Leydig cells, and these are cells that produce androgens, which are the male sex hormones. And these cells basically live in the spaces around the seminiferous tubules. So if I take a cross section through one of these lobules here, I would see all of the seminiferous tubules. This would be my uh, septa testis out here, dividing one lobule from another. And then you can see that the interstitial endocrine cells are just scattered about in between the seminiferous tubules. So the seminiferous tubules are making sperm, and the interstitial endocrine cells are making the androgens or male sex hormones. In this section, we're going to continue with the male reproductive structures, and now we're going to look at the epididymis, the ductus deferens, and the male urethra. So the epididymis is an organ that represents the start of the male reproductive tract. So the tract is going to be the portion where the sperm are going to travel. And the epididymis is a coiled tube that is bound to the posterior border of each testis. So it basically looks like it's wrapping around the backside of the testis. Each epididymis is 23 feet long. So we can divide the epididymis into the head, the body, and the tail. So the head is the largest part, and it sits on top of the testis, and it receives sperm from the efferent ductules that are coming out of the reti testis. The body then extends inferiorly around the back of the testis, and then the tail has far fewer coils than the head and the body, and the tail connects to the ductus deferens. Sperm can be stored in the tail. And sperm are moved along these 23 feet of coiled tubes by fluid movement and peristaltic contractions. And it can take a single sperm three weeks to move through the entire epididymis. So from the start at the head all the way through the tail and into the ductus deferens, that uh, path can take three weeks to travel. The epididymis has three functions. First, it monitors and adjusts the composition of the fluid that is produced by the seminiferous tubules. And this fluid makes up part of the fluid component of semen. Second, it acts as a recycling center for damaged sperm. So as sperm is moving through the epididymis, it can be basically scanned to see if the sperm is normal or if it is abnormal in any way. And if it's damaged or abnormal, it can be reabsorbed, broken down, and the parts can be reused to make new sperm. And it can store and protect the sperm and facilitate their functional maturation, which we'll talk about in a bit. So the ductus deferens is also called the vas deferens. So when this is cut as a uh, surgical method for contraception, it is still called a vasectomy. So a vasectomy would be the cutting of the vas deferens, which we're now calling the ductus deferens. So the ductus deferens is a long tube. It's about 18 inches long, and it runs from the tail of the epididymis up to the ejaculatory duct that sits on the uh, back underside of the bladder. So it travels up into the abdominopelvic cavity through the inguinal canal. It passes posterior and inferior to the bladder. And then the lumen enlarges just before it ends. And so here, the swollen area here is called the ampulla of the ductus deferens. The walls of the ductus deferens have smooth muscle for peristaltic contractions. And the ductus deferens itself can also store sperm for several months in the ampulla. So the ejaculatory duct is down here. It starts at the junction between the ductus deferens and the seminal gland, which we'll talk about in another section. And then the ejaculatory duct empties into the prostatic urethra. So it is mixing sperm that comes through the ductus deferens with secretions made by the seminal glands to create semen. The male urethra we covered in the urinary tract system, but to refresh your memory, uh, the male urethra is seven to eight inches long. 
and it runs from the urinary bladder to the tip of the penis and is divided into three regions. So the prostatic urethra runs through the middle of the prostate gland. The membranous urethra runs through the muscles that make up the floor of the pelvic cavity. And the spongy urethra runs through the penis itself. So the male urethra is used by both the urinary and the reproductive systems. So it conducts urine to the exterior for the urinary system and it conducts semen to the exterior for the reproductive system. And now we'll take a look at the accessory glands and semen and also talk about an enlarged prostate and prostate cancer. So the male reproductive system has three main accessory glands. These are going to be the seminal glands, shown here, the prostate gland, shown here, and then the bulbal urethro glands, shown here. So the major functions of the male accessory glands overall are to secrete chemicals that activate sperm, to provide nutrients that the sperm need for motility, to propel the sperm and fluids along the reproductive tract, which occurs mainly by peristalsis, and to produce buffers that counteract the acidity of both the male urethra and the female uh, vagina. And so both of these environments can be pretty acidic. So the seminal glands, also called seminal vesicles, are tubular glands that are san sandwiched between the posterior wall of the bladder and the rectum. And they're shown here in this image. Each one is about six inches long, but it's tightly coiled, so it only appears to be about two inches long. The secretions from the seminal glands are 60% of the volume of semen. And again, remember, semen is a combination of fluid plus sperm. So the seminal gland secretions are slightly alkaline, which help to neutralize the acids in both the male urethra and the female vagina. The secretions also have high levels of fructose, which provide an energy source for sperm. It also contains chemicals called prostaglandins, which stimulate muscle contractions along both the male and female tracts, and these muscle contractions result in peristalsis. And it contains fibrinogen, which is the same fibrinogen we talked about earlier when we talked about blood clotting uh, in the blood chapter. And the fibrinogen in this case causes the semen to clot shortly after ejaculation. So it forms a temporary semen clot in the vagina. And then the secretions from the seminal glands are discharged into the ejaculatory duct shown here where they mix with sperm coming from the ductus deferens. So the prostate gland is a small muscular rounded organ that is inferior to the bladder. It surrounds the superior portion of the urethra called the prostatic urethra. The prostate gland produces prostatic fluid. The secretions of the prostate gland make up 30% of the volume of semen. And these secretions are slightly acidic and it is rich in enzymes that assist with clotting and fibrinolysis, which is the dissolving of the clot. So the fluid from the prostate is ejected into the prostatic urethra by peristaltic contractions of the prostate wall. And then you have the bulbo urethral glands shown down here. These also can be called Cowper's glands. And these are mucous glands that sit right at the base of the penis. They secrete a thick alkaline mucus. This helps to neutralize urinary acids. So remember in the urinary system chapter and in chapter 27, we talked about how the kidney can secrete hydrogen ions and that would make the uh, urine acidic. So these alkaline secretions help to neutralize those urinary acids, and it also helps to lubricate the tip of the penis. So now let's look at the composition of semen. So a typical ejaculate contains between two to five milliliters of semen, 
And semen contains a mixture of sperm, which are the male gametes. So a normal sperm count is 20 to 100 sperm per milliliter of semen. And more than 60% of those sperm need to be normal and not damaged in any way. So semen also contains seminal fluid. So remember, when you use the term semen, you're talking about a mixture of the sperm and seminal fluid. So seminal fluid is the fluid component of the semen. This includes secretions from the seminal glands, which make up about 60% of the volume, secretions from the prostate gland, which makes up 30%, secretions from nurse cells in the testes, and then secretions from cells in the epididymis, which make up another 5%, and then secretions from the bulbourethral glands, which makes up another 1-5%. to So seminal fluid contains several important enzymes. It contains proteases, which dissolve the vaginal mucus and allow the sperm to swim up through the uh, vagina to the uterus. It contains seminal plasmin, which is a protein with antibiotic properties that is thought to prevent urinary tract infections in men. So again, remember that semen and urine are sharing the urethra. Seminal fluid also contains enzymes to coagulate the semen within a few minutes after ejaculation. And it's the same process we looked at before where the fibrinogen gets converted to fibrin to form a clot. And this ensures that the semen stays in the vaginal canal long enough to give the sperm time to start swimming upward towards the uterus and uterine tubes. But then it also contains fibrinolysin, which is an enzyme that liquefies the clot after 15 to 30 minutes because you don't want the clot to stay in there forever. So a little bit more about the prostate gland. Prostatitis is the term that you use for any type of inflammation of the prostate gland. Benign prostatic hypertrophy is the normal enlargement of the prostate. It usually occurs in men over the age of 50. It occurs as the testosterone production decreases and estrogen production increases, and it only becomes a problem if the swelling of the prostate gland blocks the urethra or the rectum. So in this picture here, you can see that as the prostate gland enlarges, the biggest problem is that it compresses the urethra and makes it more difficult to get the urine out. And obstruction of urine flow, as we talked about in previous chapters, can cause the urine to back up and cause kidney damage. So prostate cancer is actually the second most common type of cancer. Screening involves getting a blood test and looking for elevated levels of a um, specific protein called a prostate-specific antigen, or a PSA. So these are called PSA tests. And the treatment that you get for your prostate cancer will often vary based on how rapidly your PSA levels are rising. Digital rectal exams are also important for detecting prostate problems, and this is where the doctor will actually feel the prostate by going through the rectum. And a prostate a prostatectomy is the surgical removal of the prostate gland. In this section, we'll take a look at the anatomy of the penis. So the penis is a tubular organ for sexual intercourse and conducting urine to the exterior. The penis is composed of a root, which is where it attaches to the body wall, a body, and then a glands, which is also called the head. So the foreskin, or prepuce, is a flap of skin that surrounds the tip of the penis and covers the glands. And the picture in the textbook is actually showing a circumcised penis. So here is what it looks like when it has the foreskin intact. So this is the prepuce. So there are prepucial glands that are at the base of the prepuce that secrete a waxy substance called smegma. And unfortunately, smegma can be an excellent nutrient source for bacteria. So if the area is not washed thoroughly and frequently, it could be a problem. But as long as um, the male has good hygiene, it's typically not a problem. 
So circumcision is the surgical removal of the foreskin. So during circumcision, they cut off the foreskin. It's supposed to lower the risk of urinary tract infections, HIV, and penile cancer, but it actually still is a controversial practice. In the United States, it's typically done automatically, but in a lot of other countries, it is now being phased out. So most of the penile body contains three cylindrical columns of erectile tissue. An erectile tissue is a 3D maze of vascular channels, which is shown here in this cross section. So you can see it's this network of all of these little vessels. So at rest, blood flow is restricted into this tissue, but then blood can move into this maze of channels during an erection. And it works the same way as the clitoris in females, and we're going to look at a little bit more detail on how that works in a later section. So the three cylindrical columns that you can find in the penis are two called the corpora cavernosa. So corpora cavernosa is plural. If you were to talk about just one of these, it would be the corpora cavernosum. And so these are two columns on the anterior side of the penis. So up here in the top picture is these two purple columns here. And then in the uh, cutaway section is these two purple circles here at the top. And then there is the corpora spongiosum. This is a single column on the posterior side of the penis, shown in red in the cutaway, and then you can see it hiding underneath the two corpora cavernosa up here in this top picture, where it is also red. So the corpora spongiosum surrounds the spongy urethra, and that is why this is called the spongy urethra, because it passes through this structure called the corpora spongiosum. And the corpora spongiosum expands at the end to become the glans penis. So it expands to make the head of the penis. So now we're going to take a look at the process of spermatogenesis, which is the formation of the male gametes called sperm. So spermatogenesis is the process of sperm formation, which is formation of the male gametes. Spermatogenesis begins at puberty and continues way into late in life. Your textbook says around 70, but I've heard of men in their 80s still being able to father children. So spermatogenesis takes about 64 days from start to finish, but you always have cells in various stages of this process so that men are able to produce sperm every day. So there are three main stages to spermatogenesis. The first one is mitosis, and during mitosis you have stem cells that divide to produce primary spermatocytes. And one of these stem cells is called a spermatogonium. So a spermatogonium is a stem cell in the seminiferous tubules. Spermatogonia would be plural. The next stage is meiosis, and then remember we have a meiosis one and a meiosis two. So during meiosis one, the primary spermatocytes become secondary spermatocytes. And then during meiosis two, the secondary spermatocytes become four spermatids. And so at this stage, remember we are haploid, so we only have a single copy of each chromosome. But spermatids still look like uh, round cells. They don't yet look like sperm. So there is a third stage called spermiogenesis in which the spermatids become physically mature sperm. So let's take a closer look at where this happens. So this process starts in the outermost cells, so the outermost layer of the seminiferous tubules, and then it proceeds inward to the lumen, which is going to be the space in the middle of a tubule. So from the outer layer moving towards the lumen, you have the spermatogonia, which are going to be on the outermost layer. Then you have your primary spermatocytes in the next layer, your secondary spermatocytes in the following layer, then you've got your spermatids, which are the ones that still look round. And then you've got your physically mature sperm is going to be the final stage. 
So at the end of meiosis II, there are these four spermatids, which still look like circular cells. And then during spermiogenesis, they take on the physical characteristics of sperm, so they get the characteristic head and tail. Now another term for you, spermiation, is when the sperm actually lose their attachment to the nurse cell and they enter the lumen so that they can then move along the reproductive tract. So note these different terms and be very careful on exams and quizzes. So spelling matters between spermatogenesis, which is the creation of the gametes, spermiogenesis, which is the physical maturation of a spermatid into a uh, physically mature sperm, and then spermiation, when the sperm break free and enter the lumen. So let's talk about nurse cells because they play an important role in this process. So nurse cells can also be called Sertoli cells, and they again play a critical supportive role in spermatogenesis. So in your textbook, this is a nurse cell shown in purple. So this would be the nucleus of one nurse cell, this would be a nucleus of another nurse cell, and then I put another picture of a single nurse cell up here, so this would be the nucleus of this nurse, nurse cell. So the nurse cell cytoplasm actually surrounds the developing spermatocytes and spermatids. So in this top picture, the different spermatocytes and spermatids are shown by the purple circles. So those are the cells. You can see how the cytoplasm of the nurse cell surrounds them. And down here, the blue cells are going to be your spermatocytes and spermatids. And again, they are surrounded by the cytoplasm of the nurse cells. So the nurse cells serve five important functions. First, they help to maintain a blood testis barrier. So they have tight junctions between them and they isolate the seminiferous tubules from the general circulation. This allows the nurse cells to produce a luminal fluid that is very different from the surrounding interstitial fluid and it keeps the immune system from attacking the sperm because the sperm have markers on their cell surface that is not recognized by the immune system. So if the immune system could, quote, see them, it would attack them. The nurse cells also help to support both mitosis of the stem cells, which is happening in the outermost layer, and meiosis of the primary and secondary spermatocytes. They also support spermiogenesis, which was the process of converting the spermatids into the uh, functionally, uh, not functionally, but physically mature sperm. They secrete a hormone called inhibin that we'll talk about more later. And they secrete a protein called the androgen binding protein, which allows them to have higher than normal levels of androgens within the nurse cell than would otherwise be possible. So now let's take a look at the anatomy of a sperm. So each sperm has four distinct regions. So we have a uh, physically mature sperm shown over here on the right side. So sperm have a head, which is a flattened ellipse that contains a nucleus that has densely packed chromosomes. And remember that sperm are haploid, so they only have 23 chromosomes or one of each type. At the very tip of the head is a structure called an acrosome. So this is a membranous compartment at the tip of the head. And during development of the sperm, the Golgi apparatus forms acrosomal vesicles during this process of spermiogenesis, which is shown here in the four images on the left side. So you can see how the Golgi apparatus produces these vesicles, and these vesicles move to one side of the nucleus so that they eventually become the acrosome, which is going to be the very tip of the head. So the vesicles actually contain enzymes that are necessary for the fertilization of an oocyte. So this is where the sperm will break through the membrane of the oocyte to initiate fertilization, and the acrosome has the enzymes for it to be able to do that. So the neck of the sperm is very short, and it contains the centrioles that produce microtubules. Then you have the middle piece shown here, 
and the middle piece contains mitochondria that are wrapped in a spiral around the microtubules. So the mitochondria, if you remember, produce ATP. So this is going to be the ATP that is needed for movement of the tail. And then you have the tail, which is the only flagellum in the human body, and it is made up of microtubules. So there are no other organelles in the final sperm. So essentially, sperm are mobile carriers for chromosomes with as little size and mass as possible. So they have to have some mitochondria to make ATP for movement, but other than that, they are very scaled down and they contain very little other than a few enzymes and the chromosomes. So they lack any energy reserves, so no internal energy reserves at all. So in order for the mitochondria to make uh, any type of ATP, they have to get nutrients that are absorbed from the surrounding seminal fluid. For example, we talked about how the fluid made by the uh, seminal vesicles contains fructose, which provides an energy source for the sperm. So without the sperm having the seminal fluid, they would not ever be able to get any energy because they have no energy reserves within the sperm cell itself. And another thing the nurse cell helps with is like reabsorbing this cytoplasm that gets shed during spermiogenesis as a spermatid becomes a physically mature sperm. So when the physically mature sperm undergo spermiation, which is where they break free and enter the lumen of the seminiferous tubules, they are still functionally immature. So they are physically mature but functionally they're not able to do their jobs yet. So sperm, as mentioned before, takes two to three weeks to pass through the epididymis, and during this time they complete their functional maturation. But they are still immobile, meaning they still can't swim, so the flagella still can't move to propel the, the sperm forward. So capacitation is the activation process that must occur before a sperm can successfully fertilize an oocyte, and this process actually doesn't complete until after ejaculation when the sperm is in the vagina. So the epididymis also secretes a substance that prevents premature capacitation from occurring. So there are two steps for the capacitation to occur. In step one, the sperm become motile, meaning they have the ability to swim when exposed to seminal gland secretions. So basically, if you remember, the seminal gland secretions have the fructose, which provide an energy source for the mitochondria. So it is only at this point, when the sperm have access to that fructose, that they are able to get energy to make their uh, flagella move, so to make their tail move, and only at that point are they able to swim and become motile. And then the second step, they don't become capable of fertilization until they are exposed to conditions inside the female reproductive tracts. So they don't finish their capacitation until they are in the vagina. And since sperm are immobile until they at least go through this first step of capacitation, this is the reason why they are propelled along the reproductive tract by peristaltic contractions. So you might have always pictured the little sperm swimming everywhere they need to go, but they're actually moved by peristalsis because they can't swim until they're mixed with secretions from the seminal glands. So now we're going to look at hormonal regulation of the male reproductive system. So in men, the gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GNRH, which is a hormone released by the hypothalamus, this is released in steady pulses, meaning there is a small release of this hormone every 60 to 90 minutes. And in men, this rate stays pretty much constant throughout their lives. So as a result, the plasma levels of male hormones, so follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, and then the androgens such as testosterone, basically remain within a relatively narrow range. So men don't have the fluctuations in their sex hormones as women have, which we'll cover in a later section. So the gonadotropin-releasing hormone signals the anterior pituitary to release the two gonadotropins. 
follicle stimulating hormone is going to target the nurse cells in the testes and when the nurse cells get stimulated by both follicle stimulating hormone and testosterone they promote both spermatogenesis which is the creation of the gametes and spermiogenesis which is conversion of the spermatids into physically mature sperm and then luteinizing hormone is going to target those interstitial endocrine cells which are located between the seminiferous tubules and that's going to stimulate the production of androgens and testosterone is the main androgen so again keep in mind that for most of a male's life these levels of hormones stay pretty much steady and while the male system doesn't change as dramatically as the female system does with age males do still have what's called a male climacteric which is also called an andropause and so levels of testosterone can begin to decrease between the ages of 50 and 60 and the levels of circulating luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone actually increase because as you're going to see in a moment the uh, testosterone normally works in a negative feedback manner and testosterone re replacement therapy can help to recover lost sex drive but it also increases the risk of prostate disease so testosterone is the major male hormone and it is a type of androgen production begins around the seventh week of fetal development and we're going to look at this process in more detail in a later section and so it continues throughout the fetal and embryonic development up until a few days before birth then the levels are going to go back down to virtually non-existent and remain low during the entirety of childhood and they don't increase again until puberty so during the embryonic and fetal stage the testosterone is programming the fetal brain for male characteristics and is directing the development of the male structures and male genitalia and then the five major functions of the testosterone in the adult male are to number one allow the nurse cells to be stimulated by the follicle stimulating hormone and so again with both testosterone and follicle stimulating hormone the nurse cells promote spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis number two testosterone in adult males maintains the sexual drive so this is their libido it also stimulates muscle and bone growth and it establishes and maintains male secondary sex characteristics which are things like facial hair a deeper voice and more pronounced musculature and it maintains the accessory glands and organs of the male reproductive system so here's an overview of the hormones in the male system so we started with gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus which stimulates the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the nurse cells luteinizing hormone stimulates the interstitial endocrine cells which release testosterone which also helps to stimulate the nurse cells and so keep in mind that there is some negative feedback mechanisms so nurse cells also make a hormone called inhibin which can feed back and testosterone itself can feed back so nurse cells release inhibin when the sperm production rate becomes too high and that helps to lower the rate back to normal and then higher than level normals of testosterone can also inhibit the gonadotropin releasing hormone uh, to lower the levels back to normal but typically the male hormone levels do not fluctuate that much keep in mind too that males also have a small circulating level of estradiol which is the main form of estrogen so yes men do have small amounts of estrogen and women do have small amounts of testosterone now we will switch our attention to the female reproductive structures and we're going to start with the ovaries uterine tubes and uterus so the ovaries uterine tubes and uterus are all enclosed within a mesentery known as the broad ligament as shown in this picture here and again remember mesenteries are a double layer of peritoneal membrane and they provide a route for blood vessels and nerves so the uterine tubes run along the superior border of the broad ligament 
So the broad ligament attaches to the sides and the floor of the pelvic cavity and becomes continuous with the parietal peritoneum. The broad ligament helps to prevent or limit side-to-side -side movement of the female organs, as well as rotation of these organs. And then there are other ligaments that also help to stabilize the position of both the uterus and the ovaries. I'm not going to go into all of these different types of ligaments like your textbook does, but suffice it to say that these other ligaments help to prevent superior and inferior movements of these organs. So the ovaries have three main functions. They produce immature female gametes called oocytes. They secrete the female sex hormones, which are the estrogens and progesterone. And they secrete a hormone called inhibin. And I'm not going to go into detail later on how inhibin works. Inhibin works in a negative feedback manner in females, just like it does in males. But we have enough to talk about with the cycling of estrogen and progesterone, so I'm not going to spend uh, any more time talking about the role of inhibin. But just know that ovaries do secrete inhibin. So the visceral peritoneum that actually covers the outside of the ovary is called the germinal epithelium. And the inner tissues of the ovary, which are known as the stroma, are divided into a superficial cortex, which would be on the outside, and a deeper medulla, which would be on the inside. And the gametes are produced in the cortex or outer region. Blood vessels enter and leave the ovary through the suspensory ligament, and the area where they enter is called the hilum of the ovary. So we're going to go into more detail on the internal structures of the ovary when we cover the ovarian cycle in another section. So the uterine tubes are hollow muscular cylinders that are about 5.2 inches in length. They are also called fallopian tubes or oviducts, and they are divided into three main regions. The infundibulum is going to be the end that is closest to the ovary. It has these little finger-like projections called fimbriae, which drape over the surface of the ovary, but there is no actual physical connection. And cilia that line the, ampu the ampulla and the um, infundibulum beat to move the oocytes toward the ampulla. So the ampulla is the middle region of the uterine tube, and the isthmus is the short region connected to the uterine wall. So fertilization of an oocyte usually occurs between the ampulla and the isthmus. So a combination of cilia and peristaltic contractions move the oocytes from the ovary towards the uterus. Cells that line the uh, uterine tubes, some of these cells are called PEG cells, and they secrete a nutrient-rich fluid that completes the capacitation of the sperm and also nourishes the pre-embryo. So this is one of the reasons why fertilization doesn't occur until the sperm go into the uterine tubes is because the uterine tubes have the secretion that is necessary to complete that functional maturation of the sperm. And then the nutrients found uh, that are released by these cells provide um, food for the sperm to swim and also food for the pre-embryo once the oocyte is fertilized. So the uterus is a small pear-shaped organ that protects, nourishes, and removes waste for the developing embryo. So technically, embryo is the term you would use for weeks 1 to 8, and fetus is the terms you would use from week 9 to delivery. So the uterus sits superior to the urinary bladder. So in this picture over here, you can see the uterus is on top of the urinary bladder. This is why most pregnant women have to go to the bathroom all the time because the baby is literally sitting on their bladder. The uterus has four main regions. The body is the largest portion. The fundus is this rounded portion that is superior to where the uterine tubes attach. So very similar to how we had a fundus of the stomach. The isthmus is the narrowed portion at the bottom of the body. 
and the cervix is the inferior portion that actually extends into the top portion of the vagina. So during a pap smear, samples from the cervix are taken for analysis for early detection of cervical cancer. So let's take a closer look at the uterine wall. So the wall of the uterus has three main layers. There is the perimetrium, which is the outermost layer, and this is going to be continuous with the peritoneal lining. Then you have the myometrium, which is the, the very thick middle muscular layer. This layer is actually the largest layer. It makes up 90% of the mass of the uterus. And it is made up of smooth muscle that is in three different orientations. There is smooth muscle that is in a longitudinal layer, a circular layer, and an oblique layer. And so all of this muscle provides the force necessary to push out the fetus during delivery. And then the innermost layer shown in purple in this picture is called the endometrium. This is the thin inner glandular layer. And the endometrium is then further divided into a functional layer and a basal layer. The functional layer is the thickest of the two layers. It contains uterine glands and it undergoes dramatic changes during the uterine cycle, which we'll cover in another section. And then the basal layer stays fairly constant over time. And I will talk a bit about endometriosis in the activity video, but not in the lecture video. In this section, we're going to look at the vagina, external genitalia, and breast, which are the remaining female reproductive structures. So the vagina is an elastic muscular tube with three major functions. It's a passageway for the elimination of menstrual fluids. It receives the penis during sexual intercourse and holds sperm prior to their passage into the uterus. And it forms the inferior portion of the birth canal. So the hymen is an elastic epithelial fold that partially blocks the entrance, so it would be down here. The hymen can be stretched or torn during the first sexual intercourse with tampon use, with a pelvic examination, or even during some types of physical activity. So the hymen is not a good indicator of virginity because it can be torn even without sexual intercourse. The vagina has rugi, just like we've seen in other organs, and the rugi are folds that allow for expansion. The vagina also contains resident bacteria that are supported by cervical mucus. These bacteria create an acidic environment inside the vagina, which restricts the growth of pathogenic organisms, but it can also inhibit sperm motility. And so this is why a lot of the secretions that make up semen contain those alkaline buffers, and that is to neutralize the acids normally found in the vagina. Vaginitis is when you have an inflammation caused by a fungal, bacterial, or parasitic infections. These can be, become common in women when women take antibiotics, and the antibiotics kill the normal resident bacteria, so they are no longer able to maintain the acidity, and so these uh, pathogens can move in. So for example, women who take uh, antibiotics are usually at a higher risk for having like a yeast infection, which would be a fungal infection of the vagina. So now let's take a look at the external genitalia. So the entire area that contains the external female genitalia is called the vulva. It can also be called the pudendum. So the vestibule is going to be the central space represented by these, this black arrow here. From here to here, all of this inside would be the vestibule. So this is the central space surrounded by the labia minora, which are small folds. And the vestibule, vestibule holds the opening to both the urethra and the vagina. And the urethral opening is anterior or in front of the vaginal opening. The vestibular glands are derived from the same embryological structures as the bulbo urethral glands in males. 
and here's one of the glands shown here. These secrete mucus into the vestibule during sexual arousal, and they also keep the area moist and lubricated. And then the labia majora are these larger folds, the prominent folds of skin that encircle and partially conceal the labia minora and the other structures. So the clitoris is actually just as complex as the penis. The clitoris is the erectile tissue in females, and it's derived from the same embryonic structure as the penis in males. So the only part that you can see when you're looking at the external genitalia is the glands or the head of the clitoris. And this is covered by extensions of the labia minora that form a prepuce. So just like the glands of the penis can have a foreskin, so can the clitoris. But what you don't see is the majority of the clitoris, which is actually a very large structure. And I'm still disappointed that the textbooks don't include an image like this. So this is the full structure of the clitoris. So as I mentioned before, the, type, the part that you can see is just the tip or the head called the glands. The rest of the clitoris is an internal structure. So the clitoris has a corpus cavernosum, which are these two little legs that extend laterally that are shown in dark pink up here. So that's the corpus cavernosum. And it has a corpus spongiosum, which is also called the bulb of vestibule, and that's these lighter colored pink areas. And the corpus spongiosum actually wrap around the sides of the vagina, so they surround the vaginal opening. Now, your textbook did show you the bulb of vestibule here with this purple structure, but what they didn't show you is what the entire full structure of the clitoris looks like. So we'll just cover a little bit of the breast anatomy. So breasts are two projections anterior to the pectoral muscles of the chest that contain mammary glands, which are specialized structures of the integumentary system that produce milk. So lactation is the term used for the production of milk. And mammary glands also contain variable amounts of adipose tissue the nipple is a small conical projection where the ducts of the underlying mammary glands open up onto the body surface. And the areola is the reddish brown skin around each nipple. And this area contains large sebaceous glands which give it a grainy texture. So breast cancer is one of the most common types of cancer. So self-examination, feeling for lumps, and mammograms can help catch it early. But there is also what's called a fibrocystic disease, where some women are cloned to prones of clusters of cysts, which are little scar tissue areas that wall off inflamed lobules. And when they have these cysts in their breast, their breast can feel lumpy, and it can be very difficult to differentiate those lumps from cancer without actually having a biopsy. So I've had fi I have fibrocystic disease, so I have actually had a couple of biopsies already when they try to make sure that it's just a cyst and not a cancerous tumor. So in this section, we're going to look at oogenesis, which is the formation of female gametes, which are called oocytes. So oogenesis is the formation and development of an oocyte. This process begins before birth, and then it pauses, and then it continues between the period between puberty and menopause. So before birth and during fetal development, the stem cells undergo mitosis to form primary oocytes. So in females, the reproductive stem cell is called an oogonium, and oogonia would be plural. So the primary oocytes will then start meiosis I, which is the first stage of meiosis, but then they pause, and they pause at a stage called prophase I. So it's like hitting the pause button uh, when you're watching a TV show, for example, except then they stay paused until puberty. So at birth, a female has approximately 2 million primary oocytes. 
However, a lot of these degrade and degenerate. So by the time she reaches puberty, she only has about 400,000 left. The remainder uh, degenerate in a process called atresia. So then once a month at puberty, some of the primary oocytes are stimulated to finish meiosis one. So only then are they able to hit the play button again and to resume meiosis one, and then they finish and they produce secondary oocytes. The secondary oocyte then starts meiosis two, but again pauses, hits the pause button, and is basically suspended halfway through in metaphase two. So during ovulation, the ovaries are releasing a secondary oocyte that is still paused in metaphase two. Also note that unlike spermatogenesis, the cell divisions in oogenesis are not equal. So every time you have meiosis, so meiosis one and meiosis two, one cell keeps most of the organelles in cytoplasm and the other cell basically gets cheated and only has the one copy of each type of chromosome, but nothing else. And so these little very small cells are called polar bodies and they are non-functional cells that are produced during oogenesis and they will eventually disintegrate. So unlike uh, spermatogenesis where we started with a single uh, stem cell and we ended up with four spermatids, with oogenesis, we start with a single stem cell and end up with a single oocyte. So the process of oogenesis does not complete until fertilization occurs. So it's not until the sperm has entered the egg that the secondary oocyte will complete meiosis II to become a mature ovum. So it doesn't actually be, stay a mature ovum for very long because, because once the nucleus of the sperm unites with the nucleus of the ovum, then you have a new diploid cell called a zygote. And a diploid cell means now we have two copies of every chromosome because we get one copy from the mother and one copy from the father that is coming in via the sperm. So the entire process of oogenesis and the release of secondary oocytes stops at menopause. So here is an image from chapter 29, which we're not covering. Um, and this kind of gives you the rest of the story. So at ovulation, you have the oocyte, which again is in suspended halfway through meiosis two. So it's suspended in metaphase two. Uh, the polar body may also still be uh, accompanying it. And then note that it has these cells around it called the corona radiata. So the corona radiata cells are the same granulosa cells that are released with the secondary oocyte during ovulation, which we're about to learn about when we cover the ovarian cycle. So the sperm then have to use that acrosome that contains those enzymes that we talked about to push their way past the corona radiata cells to get to the egg and to, then to actually penetrate into the egg. So once the sperm enters the egg, that is when the uh, secondary oocyte will finish meiosis two. So now it is a mature ovum. So then the nucleus of the sperm and the uh, ovum are going to uh, then combine. So you're gonna have these uh, nucleus of the fertilizing sperm, the female egg nucleus. You're gonna have them getting ready to combine where you're gonna get ready to start cell division. So by the time they combine, you immediately go into cell division and start forming the embryo. In addition to oogenesis, which is a bit more complex than spermatogenesis, the female system also has two other cycles that are occurring. And so we're gonna look at the first of these now, and this is the ovarian cycle. So some terminology uh, to get started. An ovarian follicle is a specialized structure in the cortex of the ovaries where oogenesis begins. So all of these little structures here at the top of this picture are different follicles in various stages of development. So the ovarian cycle 
is the monthly process of the maturation, ovulation, and degeneration of a tertiary follicle. This is a 28-day cycle, and it's divided into two main phases. The follicular phase lasts about 14 days, and the luteal phase lasts another 14 days. So some terminology before we start stepping through uh, this actual cycle. So the granulosa cells, which can also be called follicular cells, these are the small little cells shown in your textbook image that are around the O site in the middle. But I like this image a little bit better because it's color coded. So in this image, the granulosa cells are shown in green. So you can see how they progress and change with the follicle. And so these are cells that produce estrogens, and then later on they produce follicular fluid. Fecal endocrine cells are shown in this image in uh, this reddish color, and they surround the follicle starting when it gets to the secondary follicle phase, and these cells also produce estrogens. So first we have to look at a couple of things that are happening behind the scenes. So these are things that are continuously going on and they're not part of the monthly ovarian cycle, but they are continuous events that are leading up to the events of the ovarian cycle. So first, number one, you have these structures called primordial ovarian follicles, which are clustered in egg nests in the ovarian cortex. And that is shown down here as number one. These are your little primordial ovarian follicles. And then here is an example of one from this other image. So each one of these uh, primordial follicles is surrounded by a single layer of granulosa cells. And remember, these are also called follicular cells. Each ovary has about 200,000 primordial follicles at puberty. So that's why I said by puberty, a female has 400,000 of the uh, primary oocytes. So primordial follicles are continuously activated to start maturing. So uh, just kind of like with the spermatogenesis process, you're always going to have some that are in different stages of maturation. So the next part is that over the period of a year, many of those primordial follicles will become primary ovarian follicles, shown here by the number two. The granulosa cells enlarge and start producing estrogens. They also form a layer around the primary oocyte, which is the cell in the middle. And so as they're forming this layer around the primary oocyte, this layer is called the zona pellucida. This is a region where the granulosa cells are interacting with the oocyte. And so the um, zona pellucida would be this dark line right here in the middle at the border between the granulosa cells, also called follicle cells, and the oocyte in the middle. And there's a lot of little uh, microvilli that form in this area, and this helps with the uh, follicle or granulosa cells being able to transport nutrients and waste into and out of the oocyte to help with the oocyte growth and development. In the next four months or so, a few of the primary follicles will mature into secondary ovarian follicles, shown by the number three. So at this point, you start to get fecal cells that start to surround the follicle. And the primary oocyte in the middle is continuing to grow and develop very slowly. Over the next two to four months, the granulosa cells are going to start secreting follicular fluid. And as the fluid builds up, you'll actually be able to see this fluid compartment inside the follicle. So the fluid accumulates in this pocket called an antrum, as you can see here and in the picture from the textbook. When the secondary follicle has doubled in size, it is now considered to be a tertiary uh, ovarian follicle, and it is now ready to participate in the 28-day ovarian cycle. So again, keep in mind that these first four stages that we looked at are a continuous ongoing process that is hormone independent. It is only once the follicle becomes a tertiary follicle that it is affected by hormones and the ovarian cycle. 
So now let's look at the actual ovarian cycle, starting with the follicular phase. So the follicular phase is when a tertiary ovarian follicle matures and ovulation occurs. So at the start of each ovarian cycle, only a few tertiary follicles are ready for further development. And so when you have the release of the follicle stimulating hormone or FSH, this causes the tertiary follicles to accelerate their development. By day five, a single tertiary follicle has outcompeted all the rest of them and becomes the dominant one. By day 10 to 14, it is large enough to create a prominent bulge on the ovary surface, as you can see here in the textbook image. Then when there is a release of the luteinizing hormone, this is going to signal the primary oocyte that is still inside the tertiary follicle to complete meiosis I and become a secondary oocyte, and then it starts meiosis II. And then remember, it pauses halfway through meiosis II. So during the process of ovulation, which occurs around day 14, the distended follicle wall ruptures, and this is going to release the secondary oocyte and some of the surrounding granulosa cells, which become the corona radiata around the secondary oocyte. So that gets released from the ovary, and then the uh, current made by the cilia lining the uterine tubes will sweep that released secondary oocyte into the uterine tube. So the luteal phase starts after ovulation and ends with the degeneration of the corpus luteum. So the first part of the luteal phase involves the formation of the corpus luteum, which is shown in the textbook image down here. The corpus luteum is a progesterone-secreting mass of follicle cells that develops in the ovary after ov ovulation. So actually, the remaining granulosa cells that got left behind after this follicle burst during ovulation, those remaining granulosa cells create the corpus luteum, and they do this under the influence of luteinizing hormone. So cholesterol is used to synthesize progesterone, which is what gives the structure a yellow color. So corpus luteum in Latin actually means yellow body. So luteum is the Latin word for yellow. And so that is because of the high concentration of cholesterol found here because these cells are using it to make progesterone. And progesterone's primary function is to prepare and support pregnancy. So think about it when you're trying to put this all together logically. I just released an oocyte during ovulation. The ultimate goal is for this oocyte to become fertilized by a sperm. And if that happens, then I will be pregnant. So it makes sense that the next stage of the ovary is to start secreting a hormone that is going to support pregnancy. So remember, progesterone is progestation. So it is the hormone that supports pregnancy. So the corpus luteum cells will also secrete some estrogens, but not as much estrogen as was being secreted before when it was a tertiary follicle. So the second part of the luteal phase is when the corpus luteum becomes the corpus albicans. And keep in mind that this only happens if fertilization does not take place. If, if there is fertilization of the oocyte by a sperm, you will keep the corpus luteum throughout the, the uh, subsequent pregnancy. So the formation of the corpus albicans starts about 12 days after ovulation. So essentially the body's waiting 12 days to see if the egg gets fertilized. If the egg didn't get fertilized, it's like, oh well, let's try again. So the corpus luteum will degenerate. Fibroblasts move in and invade the now non-functional corpus luteum and produce scar tissue, which is what actually creates the corpus albicans. So because the structure degenerates, progesterone and estrogen levels fall off markedly. 
and this marks the end of the ovarian cycle, and then you would be able to start again uh, with the next month cycle with activating some new tertiary ovarian follicles. And now we will take a look at the uterine cycle, which is also called the menstrual cycle. So the uterine cycle is a repeating series of changes in the structure of the endometrium of the uterus. And this is the innermost layer of the uterine wall. So the uterine cycle also averages 28 days and it's driven by hormonal changes from the ovarian cycle that we just looked at. So the uterine cycle is divided into three phases. The first phase is called the menstrual phase. And then some terminology for you. Menarche is the term to refer to a woman's first menstrual cycle. The second phase is called the proliferative phase. And the third phase is called the secretory phase. So the menstrual and proliferative phases occur during the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle. So the first two phases should last 14 days. And the secretory phase occurs during the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. So it should occur for 14 days. And then the word menopause technically means termination of the uterine cycle. So let's look at these three phases. And I found another image to help you correlate what's going on with the endometrial layer with what is going on in the ovary. So during the menstrual phase, this phase is marked by the degeneration and shedding of the endometrial functional layer. So menstruation, which is also called menses, is the shedding of the blood and degenerating tissues through the vagina. And some women just colloquially call this their period. So the arteries constrict, which cut off blood flow to the functional layer of the endometrium. This causes the tissues in the functional layer to degenerate. And then as the, de the degeneration is occurring, weakened artery walls will rupture, which also leads to bleeding. The menstru menstrual phase can last from one to seven days, and it's shown on this chart by this first area here. And during the menstrual phase, a total of 35 to 50 milliliters of blood is lost. The condition of dysmenorrhea is when you have a painful menstruation that results from cramping of the myometrium, which is the muscular layer of the uterus, or it can also be caused by inflammation of the uterus. So again, keep in mind that the menstrual phase is occurring during the first part of the follicular phase in the ovarian cycle. So the proliferative phase is the next step, and that's shown by this tan color down here. This is when you have the regrowth and restoration of the functional layer of the endometrium. So it grows back from the basal layer, which was not lost during menstruation. So during menstruation, you only lose the functional layer. So estrogens, which are being secreted by the developing tertiary follicle, are what stimulate and sustain the proliferative phase. So keep in mind my tertiary follicle is developing and so the, all of those granulosa cells are producing large amounts of estrogen. So the estrogen levels are rising and the rising estrogen levels are maintaining and stimulating the proliferative phase in the uterus. So by the time that ovulation occurs, the functional layer of the uh, endometrium is now several millimeters thick and uterine glands which are in the functional layer are now manufacturing a glycogen rich mucus. So then we move on to the secretory phase which is going to correlate with the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle and during this phase there is an enlargement of the uterine glands and they increase their glandular secretion of the glycogen rich mucus. So the reason they do this, again, let's think about what's happening. I just had ovulation. I just released an oocyte. The goal of the reproductive system is for that oocyte to be fertilized by a sperm, and then that would lead to pregnancy. 
And so pregnancy would result in the formation of an embryo. And so that is the reason why the secretory phase of the uterus at this point is geared up to secreting a lot of glycogen rich substances. This would be a food source for the developing embryo prior to the development of the placenta, which is going to attach the embryo to the mother's blood supply. But it takes a while for the placenta to grow. So in the meantime, this secretion by the uterine lining is going to be a food source for that early embryo. So the secretory phase begins at the time of ovulation and it continues as long as the corpus luteum remains intact. So if you did get fertilization and you have a pregnancy, then the uterine cycle would stay in the secretory phase throughout the pregnancy. So the secretory phase is triggered by the release of progesterone. And then there is a small level of estrogens that are also secreted by the corpus luteum. But at this stage, we have mostly progesterone. So the progesterone and smaller amount of estrogen is what is uh, stimulating the secretory phase in the uterus. So the secretory activity peaks 12 days after ovulation. And then again, at that point, it's like, oh, well, we didn't get a fertilized uh, zygote, so let's try again. So if fertilization doesn't occur, the glands become less active and the uterine cycle will end when the corpus luteum degenerates and becomes the corpus albicans and it stops producing hormones. So notice that once it becomes the corpus al albicans, notice that the hormone levels drop off. So progesterone woo, goes way down, estrogen woo, goes way down. And the drop in progesterone and estrogens will signal the start of the next menstrual phase. So those drops in those hormone levels is then what will trigger the menstrual phase and then that will restart the entire uterine cycle. So now we'll discuss hormonal regulation of the female reproductive system. And here's an image at the top that can help you, um, again, keep track of what is happening in the ovary versus the uterus through these different cycles. So the gonadotropin releasing hormone that is secreted by the hypothalamus in men, remember it had a steady secretion. In women, gonadotropin releasing hormone changes throughout the ovarian cycle. So the circulating levels of estrogens and progesterone can control changes in the GnRH release. So GnRH is released in pulses, which again can change in frequency, meaning that the amount being released is not going to be the same throughout the month in a female. So the pulse frequency of the gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to determine the release of the gonadotropins from the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So follicle stimulating hormone is going to start the development of a group of tertiary follicles, which will start that follicular phase of the ovarian cycle. And it's also going to result in increased estrogen secretion because as those tertiary follicles mature, they secrete more and more estrogen. And then the luteinizing hormone trigger, triggers ovulation which is the end of the follicular phase of the ovary and the start of the luteal phase. And so because in the ovary you now have that um, erupted follicle now becomes the corpus luteum, and the corpus luteum is going to secrete progesterone. So once you have ovulation, you're going to have increased progesterone secretion and decreased estrogen secretion. And again, I'm not going to go into all of the negative feedback that happens in the female system because we already have enough stuff to cover, um, as you're going to see on the next slide when we try to put it all together. All right, so this image hopefully helps to put everything together for you. So at the top, we can see the gonadotropic hormone levels. So we can see LH and FSH as well as the GnRH or gonadotropin release hormone. We can also see the stages of the development of the follicle, uh, follicles during the ovarian cycle. We can see the hormone levels, and we're going to pay attention mainly to estrogen shown in red and progesterone shown in black. 
And then down here we can see the three phases of the uterine cycle, the menstrual phase, the proliferative phase, and the secretory phase. So some key points to remember. So the follicle stimulating hormone, so it's released right here. This is where it's going to be the highest. There's a pulse later, but we're going to ignore that. So the follicle stimulating hormone is high right here. It's higher than both the GnRH and the luteinizing hormone. So when FSH is released, that's going to start the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle. So that's when we're going to have the tertiary ovarian follicle start to develop. As it develops, these granulosa cells are going to be secreting estrogen. So note that my estrogen levels are increasing. So this is going to correlate with the menstrual phase of the uterine cycle. So the menstrual phase starts off when there's actually low estrogen and low progesterone. You're going to be losing that functional layer of the endometrium. And then as the estrogen levels increase, the uterus is going to switch into the proliferative phase, which is where it is repairing and regrowing a new functional layer. Then I'm going to have this secretion of luteinizing hormone. So you see this pink line up here. I have this enormous release of luteinizing hormone. This is going to trigger the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. So it triggers the event of ovulation when the secondary oocyte is released. And then the ruptured follicle is going to become the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is going to uh, increase progesterone secretion. So notice that after ovulation, my estrogen starts to go down. And as soon as I form the corpus luteum, the progesterone levels surge and estrogen levels will increase again, but they're never going to be as high as they were when I had all those granulosa cells. So I have an increase in progesterone secretion and an overall decrease in estrogen secretion. And notice that this increase in progesterone is correlated with the secretory phase of the uterine cycle because my uterus is now going to be secreting a lot of glycogen-rich mucus in hopes that I have a fertilized um, egg, that it's going to become an embryo, an implant, and start growing. And then notice that if fertilization doesn't occur, the corpus luteum degenerates and becomes the corpus albicans. And at this point, the progesterone and estrogen levels fall. Woo, they go way down. And at this point, this is going to trigger the next menstrual phase of the uterus. And it will also be a trigger for a new release of follicle stimulating hormone, which will start everything over. So males have relatively stable sex hormone levels, and women's sex hormone levels change dramatically every month through this 28-day cycle. So now let's look specifically at the role of the estrogens. So the estrogens are a group of female sex hormones, which include estradiol, which is the main estrogen, and it also includes two others called estrone and estriol. So estradiol, which is the main estrogen, is actually synthesized from testosterone. So I mentioned earlier how cholesterol is used to make progesterone. Well, then there is a several more chemical steps where cholesterol is converted into androstenedione, which is then converted into testosterone, which is then converted into estradiol. And then there's another pathway to make the other estrogens. So estradiol is actually synthesized from testosterone. So estrogens have five main functions. First, they stimulate bone and muscle growth in females. So notice again, men have testosterone levels pretty much their entire lives, so they maintain their bone and muscle growth. In women, estrogen production ends at menopause, which is why women are at higher risk for bone loss, like with osteoporosis, because they no longer have the estrogens after menopause to keep their bone growth healthy. Estrogens also maintain female secondary sex characteristics like breast, the body hair distribution, and the location of adipose tissue deposits. So women tend to have more adipose tissue deposited in their hips, which is why they end up with wider hips. 
Estrogens can also affect the central nervous system activity. Specifically, uh, estrogens promote the sex drive in females, so it increases the sex drive in the hypothalamus, so it's responsible for the libido in females. Estrogens maintain the functional accessory reproductive glands and organs, and it initiates the repair and growth of the endometrium. And then remember, progesterone is geared toward preparing and maintaining a pregnancy. So progesterone, progestation. So contraception is a method to prevent pregnancy. This can include abstinence, so not having sex, barrier methods like condoms, intrauterine devices, which are called IUDs, surgical methods like a, a vasectomy or a hysterectomy, and chemical methods like the birth control pills. So birth control pills usually involve different combinations of estrogens and progesterone to disrupt the normal ovarian and uterine cycles. And so if those cycles do not stay in sync like we just looked at, then a woman cannot get pregnant. So the most common method of the birth control pills is to disrupt or suppress the gonadotropin release from the pituitary, so it basically will interfere with the FSH and the LH. Infertility is the inability to conceive or carry a pregnancy to term after one year of unprotected intercourse. In males, it could be due to a low sperm count or low sperm motility. In females, anything that disrupts that balance of cycles that we looked at can cause infertility. Amenorrhea is the term to refer to the absence of a menstrual cycle in females. Primary amenorrhea is when a girl fails to start menstruation, so she never has her menarche or her first menstrual cycle. Secondary amenorrhea can be caused uh, in any woman, and it can be caused by malnutrition, leptin levels that are too low. So we talked about in Chapter 18 about how leptin levels were necessary uh, for the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone and leptin is secreted by adipose tissue. So women who have much too low body fat have trouble uh, with having their menstrual cycle. This is why uh, female athletes might stop having their menstrual cycle. And then severe physical or emotional stress can also disrupt the cycles. In this section, we're going to take a closer look at sexual function and the function of erectile tissue. So recall from chapter 16 when we talked about the autonomic nervous system in A and P1, we mentioned that the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and digest division of your autonomic nervous system, controls arousal and the erection of the erectile tissue in the reproductive systems. So this would be the penis in males and the clitoris in females. And during arousal, the bulbourethral glands in the male and the vestibular glands in the female also increase their rates of secretion under control of the parasympathetic nervous system. So parasympathetic nervous system is all about arousal and erection. And then the sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight division, controls the actual orgasm. And then the aftermath, which is called detuminescence. So let's look at some of this terminology. So erection occurs when the blood enters the corpus cavernosum and the corpus spongiosum. And both of these structures can be found in both the penis and the clitoris. And we're gonna look in more detail in just a second. Orgasm is the actual ejaculation in males and vaginal contraction in females. And it also stimulates the reward centers of the brain to release dopamine, which causes intensely pleasurable sensations. Detuminescence is when the blood leaves the erectile tissue and the erection is lost, so the erectile tissues become flaccid. So as we mentioned earlier, erectile tissue is a maze of 3D vascular tissue. And it's made up of the corpus cavernosum, and the corpus spongiosum. And so if we compare the clitoris and the penis, they're actually not all that different. So they both have a glands or a head region. 
They also both have these two large areas of corpus cavernosum shown in um, this pink color. And they also have an area of corpus spongiosum shown in this peachy salmon color. So during arousal, the parasympathetic innervation causes the smooth muscle in the artery walls to release nitric oxide. And nitric oxide causes vasodilation, which is allow, going to allow blood to flow into this 3D maze of vascular tissue and that will allow the tissue to become engorged and it'll become then firm. So this is what that looks like. So this is a cross section of the penis. So here are your two uh, corpus cavernosa and your corpus spongiosum. So when those arteries are constricted, blood flow is restricted to these areas. And so this would be when the penis or clitoris are flaccid or not erect. And then during an erection, when the nitric oxide is released, it causes vasodilation. Blood moves into all of these areas, into these uh, networks of vessels, which is going to cause an engorgement and a firming of the tissue. And again, this happens in both the penis and the clitoris. And did you know that medications like Viagra enhance the effects of nitric oxide by inhibiting the enzyme that breaks it down? So with medications like Viagra, you can keep the vasodilation going on for longer, and it does have the exact same effect on female erectile tissue as it does on male erectile tissue. So Viagra would be equally beneficial for women as it is for men. And then in this final section, we're gonna talk about sex development, development of the sexual structures and the genitalia, and we'll also talk about intersex, gender identity, and sexual attraction. And I like to include this because I don't think it is taught enough, and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. And one thing that is a pet peeve of mine is when I hear someone say, oh, well, that's not how biology works, when they don't really know how the biology works. So the exact same embryological structures exist for both male and female parts. So prior to uh, six to seven weeks of an embryo, the embryo is actually sexually neutral. It can develop either way. So for example, if you look at this picture up here, this would be a seven week uh, embryo. So the folds of tissue shown in yellow, for example, could become either a penis or a labia minora and the tissue shown in green could be like either a scrotum or a labia majora. So basically up to seven weeks, we all look exactly the same. So if the fetus has an SRY gene and the SRY gene is usually on the Y chromosome, there are cases where it can be moved to the X chromosome. It's usually on the Y chromosome and it stands for sex determining region of the Y chromosome. So if there is an SRY gene present, the undeveloped gonads, so the gonads have not yet developed, they will get a signal to develop into testes. Otherwise, without the signal from the SRY gene, they will automatically develop into ovaries. So now let's look at the development of the external genitalia. So if testosterone is present, and testosterone would normally be secreted by the testes, then the external genitalia will develop into the male structures. So if you have androgens present, remember testosterone is the primary androgen, then all of these structures that I showed you up here will then develop following the male pathway. Otherwise, without the testosterone, so in the absence of androgens, these same structures will develop into the female structures. So under the influence of androgens, you'll get a penis and a scrotum. Without the influence of androgens, you will get the labia minora, uh, minora, the clitoris, and the vagina. Now, I was so happy to see that your textbook finally put this in the textbook, starting with the 11th edition. So we are making some progress. Yay! I wish they would go in a little bit more detail, but some progress is better than none. 
So your textbook has a very similar diagram to what I just showed you, except theirs is not as pretty color-coded. So we're going to look at this, but I'm also going to put the color-coded version down here because it can make it a little bit easier to see. So in that early uh, embryo, there's a structure called the genital tubercle, and that is shown here. And in this earlier picture, the genital tubercle was shown in red. So the genital tubercle can either develop into the penis in males or the clitoris in females. And so again, if you go back to that earlier picture I showed you where the penis and the clitoris actually look very similar, it shouldn't surprise you knowing that they come from the exact same uh, embryonic structure. Then you have these urethral folds, which are shown up here in the embryo. And the urethral folds were shown in yellow on that picture from the previous slide. So the urethral folds will develop either into the spongy urethra of the males, and they'll also um, make sort of the, the um, skin around the outside of the penis, or they will develop into the labia minora in the females. And then the genital swelling, which is this area out here in the embryo, will develop either into the scrotum in the males or the labia majora in the females. And in this picture from the previous slide, the genital swelling was shown in this teal color. So this gives you a little bit more detail into how these structures can develop into either the male genitalia or the female genitalia. So there's a little bit more to the story because there's also stuff going on on the inside. So all of this was just looking at external genitalial structures, but there are also internal structures. So we also have to look at two other structures called the Wolfian duct and the Mullerian duct. So up here at the top of the picture, I have these gonads that have not yet differentiated, so they're calling them bipotential, meaning these gonads still have the potential to become either testes or ovaries. Remember again, testes form inside the pelvic cavity, and then in males, they descend down into the scrotum right before birth. So these two other structures we're going to look at, the Wolfian duct is shown in this dark blue, and the Mullerian duct is shown in the red. So let's look at the Wolfian duct first. So if testosterone is present, so if you got a testes that is making testosterone, the Wolfian duct is going to develop into the epididymis, the ductus deferens, the ejaculatory duct, the prostate gland, and the seminal vesicles. So all of the internal male structures. So again, the Wolfian duct becomes all of these internal male structures if you have testosterone present. If testosterone is not present, the Wolfian duct degenerates. So again, if you just look at the dark blue structure up here, the dark blue structure becomes male structures this path, and it degenerates as shown by the dark blue dotted line over here. So the Mullerian duct if there are no hormones around, the Mullerian duct will automatically become the uterus, the uterine tubes, and the top of the vagina, and this is going to be an automatic pathway if there are no male hormones. And again, we're looking at the red one this time. However, if there is a hormone called the Mullerian inhibiting factor, or MIF, and by the way, the Mullerian inhibiting factor is released by the testes. So if you got testes, you're going to have this Mullerian inhibiting factor, and that is going to cause the Mullerian duct to degenerate, which is shown by the dotted red line over here. So now let's look at the development of the reproductive system, and I put a little flow chart here that can kind of help you understand what is going on. So remember that uh, prior to seven weeks of the embryo's development, I've got gonads that are indifferent or bipotential. They haven't become either testes or uh, ovaries. I have my Wolfian duct. I have my Mullerian duct. And then from that picture from your textbook, we also saw the exterior structures, which were the genital tubercle, the urethral fold, and the genital swelling. So if I have an SRY gene, which again is normally on the Y chromosome, 
then the gonads will be triggered to develop into testes. Once I have testes, they are going to start producing testosterone and mullerian inhibiting factor. So with the testosterone, the Wolfian duct will then develop into the ductus deferens, the prostate gland, and the epididymis, and the other male structures that I ran out of room to put here, so like the seminal glands, um, the ejaculatory duct, etc. With the mullerian inhibiting factor, my mullerian duct is going to degenerate, so that is caused by the mullerian inhibiting factor. And then with the testosterone, those external structures will develop into the penis, the spongy urethra, and the scrotum. All right, so notice that on the female side, nothing actually causes anything to happen over here. Everything that happens on the female side is an absence of something. So if I don't have an SRY gene, so an absence of an SRY gene causes the gonads to become ovaries. Once they've developed into ovaries, the ovaries do not secrete testosterone and they do not secrete uh, the Mullerian inhibiting factor. So with the Wolfian duct, without testosterone, it degenerates. So in no testosterone case, it degenerates. The Mullerian duct doesn't need anything uh, to cause it to become the uterus and uterine tubes and upper vagina. You can also think of this as just being a lack of the Mullerian inhibiting factor. And then again, with no testosterone around, the genital tubercle, the urethral fold, and the genital swelling will develop into the clitoris, labia minora, and labia majora. So it seems pretty cut and dry, except there's a lot of places where this pathway can take some surprising turns. So intersex occurs when the external genitalia do not match the internal sex organs or the genetic sex, like XX or XY. And this is actually a lot more common than people think. It occurs in 1 in 1,500 babies. And it also includes cases where the genitalia may be ambiguous. So you might have a structure that looks like a very small penis called a micropenis, or a structure that looks like a very large clitoris called clitoromegaly. And again, this shouldn't surprise you if you go back and look at the similarities between the penis and the clitoris. So it used to be that doctors would make a decision at the birth, and sometimes they wouldn't even tell the parents, and they would make cosmetic alterations. So like if they thought that a uh, baby girl had a clitoris that was too large, they might actually cut it down without even letting the parents know. Or if a boy was born with a micro penis, some male doctor thought, well, it would be horrible for this little boy to have to live with a small penis. So they would actually cut it off and do cosmetic alterations to turn him into a girl and then tell the parents, oh, you had a little baby girl. So this actually used to be pretty common because people just didn't know better and this type of information was just not spread around. There was no education about how the um, reproductive systems develop. And so we're going to talk about some examples in the activity video of how that process that I just showed you can take different turns. But here are some examples just to show you that it's not always so cut and dry. So for example, if you have an XX individual, this should normally, you know, most people would say, oh, XX, you have to be a girl. But you could have an XX individual who has a mutation that causes her adrenal glands to secrete excessive androgens. So remember, adrenal glands do produce androgens, and testosterone is an androgen. So if this happens during development, you can have an XX individual who is born with ovaries but external male genitalia. Another example, you can have an XY individual who has a mutation in that SRY gene on the Y chromosome. So the result would be an XY individual who ends up having ovaries and external female genitalia. You could have an XY individual who has a mutation in the androgen receptors. And as we talked about in chapter 18, a hormone cannot exert its effects unless it can bind to the receptor. So in this case, you may be secreting uh, androgens, but the receptors can't sense it as there. And you can end up with an XY individual who has internal testes and external female genitalia. 
and I'm going to put a video on D2L with some stories by people who are actually intersex so you can hear from them what it's like being intersex. But basically the bottom line is it's not just male and it's not just female. There are varieties of sex and intersex. And this uh, table lists some of them as well as conditions caused by the inheritance of one too many sex chromosomes or one too few sex chromosomes. And then it gets more complicated. So what we just talked about was the development of the internal structures into the internal reproductive structures, the external structures into external genitalia, and the development of the gonads. But you've also got the brain. So levels of estrogen and testosterone that is present during the development of the embryo and fetus can also affect the patterning of the brain. And this is a funny little cartoon up here, but there are a lot of areas of the brain that are different between men and women. So there are male and female brains and behaviors. They have shown this in laboratory studies. Like for example, if they take a male rat and they let him grow up to be a, an adult male rat that's intact, he exhibits male rat behaviors like mounting and humping females. But if you take away his testosterone during the critical period of brain development, he becomes a feminized male who shows the female mating behaviors. If you take a neonatal female, let her develop normally, she'll develop female behaviors. If you actually apply testosterone during a critical period, she becomes a masculinized female and exhibits male behaviors. The patterning in the brain can also affect a person's gender identity or how they see themselves, and it can affect your sexual attraction or orientation. So in reality, we don't have like just one or the other. With gender identity, there is a whole spectrum between being a woman or a man. If you don't identify as either, you're called gender queer. Gender expression is how you express yourself, so like maybe how you dress, behave, and interact with others. These can range from feminine to masculine to anywhere in between. Then you have your biological sex, which, which isn't even as cut and dry as I just explained to you. So you can have a female, a male, but there's a lot of variability where you can have these intersex conditions. And then you've got the actual attraction that you feel for others. So your sexual orientation, which can range from heterosexual to homosexual with bisexual in the middle. Also keep in mind that what we think of is things like masculine and feminine are actually cultural classifications. If you look at different cultures around the planet and even at different cultures over uh, the historical periods, our ideas of what is masculine and what is feminine changes quite a bit. So that is not a biological classification, that is a cultural classification. So biologically, there is no one single set of physical or mental characteristics that are entirely male or entirely female. So it is less accurate to think in terms of black and white that it's male or female, and it's more accurate to think that there's this entire spectrum, and the spectrum is determined by the coding in the brain. So you've got feminine coding of the brain, masculine coding of the brain, and then you've got chemistry, by, uh, which is determined by like which gonads you get and what your hormone levels are. And so there's feminine chemistry and masculine chemistry. And so there's this entire spectrum that people can be um, with regards to their uh, sexual identity. So pretty much try to be very accepting of people who maybe are different from you. So achieving, nurturing, and defending equality and acceptance for all. We are all human. And hopefully I just explained to you how even when it comes to sex, there can be a spectrum and it's not straight cut and dry male versus female. And that is the end of chapter 28 and the end of AMP2 material.